Hey, we're moving on to chapter five today in AP Biology, which is macromolecules. And we're gonna go straight to the intro because we have no time to spare. What's up everybody? This is Mikey from AVO Prep Academy. And today we're moving on to that last chapter of unit one, which is chapter five on macromolecules. And this chapter is divided into five parts. The first part is about polymers in general and how small building blocks can eventually build larger molecules in biological systems. The second, third, fourth, and fifth parts are each devoted to one of the four macromolecules that we need to know for AP biology, being carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. But just as a forewarning, we're going to actually create an entirely separate video for proteins, which I personally think is the most important part of this chapter. So we're going to try to release that video simultaneously to this video so you get a full comprehensive review of chapter five. And we'll put a link to that video right here on the card and below in the link description as well. So let's get right to that very first part. The first part is about polymers in general, because the term polymer is not one that's specific to any of these four macromolecules, but something that simply means many units, because the word poly means many and mer means units. And you can think of this kind of like a big Lego set, wherein the entire Hogwarts castle or a pirate ship is built from individual Lego blocks that make a whole. So then what are those individual blocks called? Well, they're going to be called monomers, mono meaning one, mer meaning unit. So let's take a look at this diagram of the polymerization process so that we can talk about two very important ideas. Now, the first is that, as you can see in this picture, we have a short polymer of three to four units, and then we have a small monomer that is about to join in. Now, first thing you see during this process where the monomer joins the polymer is the removal of water or H2O from that process. Now, this is called a dehydration synthesis or often referred to as condensation reaction. See, the word dehydration or the removal of water or condensation, the formation of water, is simply referring to this water being released from this polymerization process just from different perspective, whether it's the system or the molecule. Now, one thing that I want you guys to notice here is that the reversal reaction called hydrolysis is going to break down that monomer off of a polymer. So these are reversible reactions that simultaneously happen in biology all the time. Now, the other thing that I want you guys to keep in mind is the orientation of these monomers. You can see on the left side of the polymer, you have a hydroxide group and the right side of the polymer, you have a hydrogen group. And the incoming monomer also faces the same way. Much like when you build Legos, there are different sides to the Lego piece. And if you want to continue building a large column of Lego blocks, then you have to make sure that they face the same direction. And that directionality is going to be really important for certain macromolecules, particularly things like DNA and RNA. So it's really important to keep in mind the directionality of polymerization in this chapter. After. Let's go right ahead to the second part, which is carbohydrates. And the way that we're going to cover each of these macromolecules is talking generally about its function, about its structural components, and any of the other information that you might need to keep in mind for further studies into additional chapters beyond chapter five. So what are the functions of carbohydrates? Well, for one, carbohydrates are generally used as energy sources for all the cells. See glycolysis, which is a universal process that happens across all of the cells in the living realm, is going to be utilizing glucose as its primary sugar of choice. So utilizing that glucose, glycolysis will then start the process of cell respiration, which ultimately results in the formation of ATP that cells use for energy. Now, another function of carbohydrates hydrates in plants specifically is for structure. So we're going to see that in just a few moments. Firstly, let's think about the structure of carbohydrates. They generally have a one to two to one ratio of carbons to hydrogens to oxygens. So if you hear something like C3H6O3 or C6H12O6, you know that these are going to be carbohydrates. Now, when we talk about carbohydrates, we have to start with the monomers. The monomers of carbohydrates are often called monosaccharides. Monosaccharides meaning single sugars. In AP Biology, they introduce you to seven monosaccharides, and they're going to be categorized based on two factors. One is how many carbons they have, and the second is where that carbonyl group is. But just keep in mind that things like glyceraldehyde, dihydroxyacetone, and ribulose 
are sugars that you're going to see once again in chapter 9 and 10 as we talk about energetics. The five carbon sugar that we call ribose that you see in this picture, well, that's going to come out in nucleic acids. So you want to keep an eye on that. However, let's focus on the hexoses, which are our six carbon sugars. We have glucose, we have galactose, and we have fructose. The one to keep an eye on is, of course, glucose, because we see that a lot in AP Biology. But just so that we can build a decent foundation for how the bonding between sugars come about, we're going to talk first about disaccharides between some of these hexo sugars. Now, the term disaccharide refers to di meaning two, saccharides meaning sugars. So the first disaccharide that we're going to look at is maltose. Now, maltose is a simple disaccharide made from two glucose monomers that you can see here forming that covalent bond between the hydroxyl group of one glucose and the hydroxyl group of the other glucose, albeit the oxygen is left behind. Now, this type of covalent bonding specific to sugar molecules is going to get a very special name called glycosidic linkage. And in your textbook, you'll learn things like one for glycosidic linkage, which simply refers to which of the carbons the hydroxide groups were attached to prior to forming that covalent bond. So one for glycosidic linkage in this case forms maltose, but there are other hexoses as we've seen. So for example, when glucose and fructose come together as a disaccharide, that forms a one two glycosidic linkage resulting in sucrose. What is sucrose? Well, that's just simple table sugar that we find all the time in our kitchens. There is one more that the book doesn't mention, which is glucose and galactose forming a disaccharide, forming what we call lactose, which is the sugar that's commonly found in dairy products. So you may have heard of that before in terms like lactose intolerance. Now that we have the general formation of these bonds between sugars, we can extend this idea further and build polymers. But lucky for us, we just have to worry about glucose forming polymers, as in we have glucose, 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 glucose to the nth power. So in this scenario, we're going to see one for glycosidic linkages across hundreds of glucose molecules. And this comes in three different forms. The first form is called starch. The second form glycogen and the third form is cellulose. But let's first focus on starch and glycogen first. In this image, you see starch and glycogen side by side. And what you'll notice is that they look very, very similar. The main difference, however, is that starch is made by plants, while glycogen is made by animals, both for storage of loose glucose molecules that may be found in the organism. Now, why would plants want to do this? Well, because plants are pretty darn good at creating sugars through photosynthesis, and they can make more sugar than they would ever use in real time. So all of that extra glucose that's being built up in the plant cells are going to be polymerized into starch molecules stored in vacuoles or even special structures like potatoes. Now for glycogen, the story is slightly different. And in the case of humans, where we have to maintain a certain blood sugar level, if you consume things like ice cream, candy bars, and a bunch of different sugary products, then your blood sugar will go up, which will then signal your liver to take in that glucose from your blood and polymerize them into glycogen and store them there for a rainy day later. Okay, so the storage polysaccharides, starch and glycogen are pretty easy to understand. But what's going on with this cellulose? Now cellulose is exclusively made by plants, much like starch, but there is one very big difference. See from glucose from its linear structure as it turns into a ring can go into one configuration called the alpha glucose or the other configuration called the beta glucose. When alpha glucose monomers come together, we have starch. But when beta glucose monomers come together, we have what we call cellulose. Now cellulose is actually a very strong substance which can form fibers. And when these fibers weave kind of like how we make blankets or t-shirts, they can form things like cell walls of plants. And another fact that is really interesting is that animals like ourselves do not have any ability to digest cellulose, which is why if you eat celery, you're actually consuming a negative calorie product because you can't break down all of the cell wall tissue, the leafy green tissue from the plants, and it's called dietary fiber. It goes straight through you without being able to be absorbed into our bodies. The next macromolecule that we're moving on to is lipids. And just like with carbohydrates, let's talk about its function first. Now, lipids are kind of special in that they are not generally water soluble. However, lipids are still important for organisms because it provides long term storage of high density energy. And we're going to see lipids forming the phospholipid bilayer or the cell membranes of 
all the cells that we have, as well as performing other functions like fluidity control in that cell structure. However, let's first talk a little bit about the structure of lipids, because one thing I said earlier is that lipids are not true polymers. However, they do share a lot of same qualities as other macromolecules in that they can form large structures, and they also use the same type of covalent bonding formed through dehydration synthesis. So for lipids, we're going to first divide them into three types that we need to know. The first type is called fats and oils. The second type is phospholipids. The third type is steroids. Let's focus on fats and oils first. Fats are comprised of two different components that are comprised together, one being glycerol, which is a three carbon alcohol, and the other three being fatty acid chains. And what happens with glycerol is that each of the hydroxides is going to be involved in a dehydration reaction with the carboxyl group attached at the end of the fatty acid chain. And the loss of that water forms a bond that we call ester linkage. Just like glycosidic linkage being applicable to covalent bonds in carbohydrates, ester linkage is the term that we use to describe covalent bonds in fats and other lipids as well. So as you can see, we have what we call a triglyceride because there is one glycerol attached to tri or three fatty acids. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that there are differences between what we call saturated fatty acid chains and unsaturated fatty acid chains. The saturated fatty acid chains have straight hydrocarbon chains because all of the carbons are attached to one another with a single bond. But in unsaturated fatty acid chains, we have a kink because of the double bond that forces the carbon molecules to bend, creating a kink in that hydrocarbon chain. Now, the main difference is that the saturated fatty acids are generally produced by animals, and we see this manifest in products like butter, while the unsaturated fatty acids are generally produced by plants, and we see that in oils. Now moving on to the second lipid is what we call phospholipid. In the last video, we talked about that phosphate group, and that's going to come into play here because the components that comprise a phospholipid still includes glycerol and two fatty acid chains, but instead of a third fatty acid chain, we're going to attach to it a phosphate. And as this picture shows, you still have that glycerol as sort of the central building block, but then the two fatty acid chains on one side and a phosphate on the other side with some extra groups on top of the phosphate allows for this phospholipid to have a very interesting quality. The quality is called amphipathic, meaning that this phospholipid is at once hydrophilic and hydrophobic simultaneously. And that's because the phosphate group that we've discussed in the last lecture is negatively charged. And as a result, it interacts well with water. But hydrocarbon chains that you see below the glycerol are going to be hydrophobic. And as a result, this molecule has a very unique quality when you combine a bunch of them in water. Because of the fact that the hydrophobic tails want to face each other and the hydrophilic heads want to face the aqueous environment, we get the formation of what we call a phospholipid bilayer. However, in a more macroscopic image, what we see is the formation of things called liposomes, which can partition the external environment from the internal environment, both of which are aqueous. And that is the rudimentary formation of a cell membrane, as we'll discover in chapter 7. Okay, now what about the last lipid, which is called steroids? Now the steroids are not as well developed in the AP Biology curriculum. However, what we will talk about is the fact that steroids can act as hormones that we see later on in chapter 11. And we also have cholesterol, which can help maintain membrane fluidity that we'll see in chapter seven. So just keep that in mind. The structure of steroids are four fused carbon rings. So they're very distinct from any other lipids that we've talked about thus far. So it should be pretty easy to recognize. So the third macromolecule is proteins. But because proteins is such a big unit, we're going to be devoting an entirely separate video for that. So you can probably find that link below in the description. So we're moving on then to the fourth macromolecule, which is nucleic acids. Now nucleic acids have a very important function in biology. They store genetic information and they're involved in the transfer of that genetic information from not only generation to generation, but within the cell as they manifest as proteins. Let's talk first about the monomers of nucleic acids. Nucleic acids as a term is by default a polymer because it means 
a polymer of nucleotides. So we're going to start with nucleotides and see what they're created from. And then we'll be able to talk about the different types of nucleic acids that we have available as well. So nucleotides are created from three different components, the nitrogenous base, a five carbon sugar, and a phosphate group. Now the nitrogenous bases come in five different varieties. We have the adenine, cytosine, thymine, guanine, and uracil. And the ribose sugar and the deoxyribose sugar are the two types of five carbon sugars used in nucleic acids. And of course, the phosphate group from that functional group section is here as well. Now that the way that this works is that the first carbon on the five carbon sugar is attached to a nitrogenous base, any one of the five, and then the fifth carbon of that five carbon sugar is attached to the phosphate. And that is how we get five different kinds of nucleotides. Now, of course, you've learned about RNA versus DNA. The difference is coming from the fact that the five carbon sugar is either a ribose sugar with a hydroxide group on the second carbon or a deoxyribose sugar with just the hydrogen on that second carbon. And as a result, all of the RNA polymers will use the ribose sugar and all of the DNA polymers use the deoxyribose sugar. And there is one more nuance here. You see, the nitrogenous bases that RNA uses are adenine, uracil, guanine, and cytosine, while DNA utilizes adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, as in uracil and thymine are the differentiating factors between RNA molecules and DNA molecules. Now, how they come together is a bit tricky because for DNA, we think about them in a linear fashion from top to bottom, as in we have a nucleotide and then another nucleotide and then another nucleotide going from top to bottom in what we call a five to three prime direction. So let's talk about RNA first because it's a little bit less complicated than DNA. So you can see that the five prime carbon with this phosphate attached is up at the top. And then of course it's attached to a particular nitrogenous base. The next one attaches to the three prime carbon with the five prime phosphate, which then has its own nitrogenous base and so on. And as this continues, you'll be able to see that we can create a very long linear nucleic acid with nitrogenous bases that can form what we call a sequence. And that sequence is important because anytime that you want to encode information, it's all about the letters and their sequence in a particular direction. Now, when it comes to DNA, the structure is a little bit more complicated because we refer to DNA as an anti-parallel double helix. And what that means is that we have two nucleotide polymers that are facing each other but in opposite ways, as in one of these nucleotide polymers is going from five to three prime and the other is going from three to five prime. And as a result, they are able to come together and twist forming that double helix. But in order to do that, we have to introduce another idea. When two of these nucleotide polymers come together, you have what we call a complementary base pairing rules that we have to follow, which means that when you have adenine on one side as a nitrogenous base, the opposite must be thymine connected to one another by two hydrogen bonds. And when you have guanine on one side, you have to have cytosine on the other connected via three hydrogen bonds. And again, the sequence on one side of that molecule is going to correspond to a complementary sequence on the other side of that molecule, which then later on will help us in things like DNA replication. So guys, here we've covered carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids with that big hole in the middle that we call proteins. Please be sure to watch that video in its entirety because the idea of proteins and how they form complex structures is going to probably comprise a large portion of the FRQ questions that you'll have to solve for the unit test. So be sure to check that out. But otherwise, we'll see you in that video in just a few minutes.